Uh, so we're now moving to our next panel discussion. Uh, the panel discussion is titled, Hello Kitty Goes to Space, New Types of Space Exploration Part uh, Partnerships. So Hello Kitty, right, is a uh, very popular, very famous uh, television program and, and in fact, a uh, set of, uh, of communication and, and uh, entertainment branding to engage a wide set of people around a particular activity. And so that's why we've chosen it as the, the title for this, this particular talk or this particular panel. Space exploration is no longer solely the province of big established space faring countries. So we all know about the Artemis program. We all know about uh, China's ILRS program. But that's not the only way in which countries, in which companies, in which the space community, the space ecosystem is participating in exploration these days. We have commercial companies that are driving towards lunar development and lunar exploration. We have commercial companies that are planning human spaceflight missions. We have smaller emerging and new entrant countries using small spacecraft to develop space exploration programs of their own, including lunar and other space science missions. As all of this occurs, it allows for more participation, it allows for more partnership, it allows for more access to space exploration. But it also can raise some questions about what are the benefits of those activities? Why should smaller and new entrants participate in space exploration? How do commercial opportunities uh, provide more, uh, more pathways and what are the benefits of those, uh, of those participation pathways? So in this panel, over the next hour or so, uh, we hope to discuss the ways in which capabilities, interests, new, capabil uh, new types of activities, and how these contributions and systems can be matched across this growing and more diverse ecosystem. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce each of the five panelists that we have. Uh, so our first panelist will be, first, first panelist will be Julie Black, who is uh, the Missions and Capabilities Delivery Director for Discovery and Sustainability at the UK Space Agency. Uh, our next speaker will be Ms. Uh, so Young Chung, who is a senior researcher within the Strategy and Planning Directorate at the CARI uh, in Korea. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Hakamata Takeshi, who is the CEO of iSpace. Uh, and we have uh, Mr. Uh, <coughs> Wakata Koichi uh, of Axiom Space, who is an astronaut and chief technology officer for the Asia Pacific region within the Axiom Space. Uh, and lastly, we have uh, Yamanaka Koji, who is the director, research unit one at the Aerospace and Research and Development Directorate within the JAXA Space Exploration Center. So welcome uh, to the panelists, and uh, let's look forward to a engaging and, and wide-ranging <laughs> discussion. So uh, as we've done before with the panels at the summit, we have uh, a few starting questions that we'll ask each of our, <coughs> excuse me, each of our panelists, and then we will move to Q&A. So uh, Q&A is done through the Whova app. Uh, please uh, open up your Whova app uh, or the Whova website and submit Q&A uh, through that app. So, uh, Julie, I, I, uh, excuse me, so uh, Yamanaka-san, I want to start, uh, start with you. Uh, we're here in Japan. Uh, can you introduce Japan's objectives in, part of, in, in the Lunar Exploration Program and how JAXA approaches partnerships in executing those, those programs? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ian san and... Uh, Hello, everybody. I'm Koji Yamanaka of JAXA Space Exploration Center. I'm director of this center. And before going to the partnership, let me quickly <laughs> go uh, the, our J J Japan and JAXA's activities, uh, which is related to the space exploration. Uh, as you know, this year we had uh, a SULIM lander uh, successfully landed on the moon with very high accuracy. We are <laughs> very happy with this result. It's, better than 100. Actually, the accuracy was much better than 100 meters. And also, uh, the swim did, uh, the, you know, survive the three times the night. So, overnight, the three times. So, it, it was very happy to us. And we, then we will have LUPEX, LUPEX is Lunar Polar uh, Explorer, uh, which is to investigate the water in the area of uh, uh, South Pole region. 
And then the Japanese, uh, Japan is contributing with Gateway as well. Gateway is flying very you know, <laughs> unique trajectory around the moon. And we are providing the uh, so-called ecosystem, uh, environment control and life support system, and the battery. And also, we, we are uh, trying to you know, transfer the cargo to the gateway, um, which we did nine times to the space station by using the HTV, and then we will do it in HTV X. And the last one, of course, pressurized rover. Pressurized rover is, uh, is a f one of the first uh, vehicles which has the habit habitant capability and also the mobility on the surface of the moon. So uh, it actually, partnership is everywhere already. For example, for, for, for the, the pressurized rover, we are cooperating with Japanese car industry. So it is a combination of the car industry and the space industry as well. And we, and we need, of course, uh, we need transportation system to the lunar surface. So for, for that purpose, we have a wonderful company like uh, Hakamada Sands iSpace. So we want to do the collaboration like that. So partnership is, is already everywhere. And I, I think I can talk in more detail in a later part of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, Slim was, was a fascinating mission to watch. It exceeded performance in, in, in so yeah. many ways, I think. I mean, surviving the night three times. Oh, yeah. Who would have thought, right? Uh, Julie, I, I, I want to come to you. So uh, we know that Japan is, is an Artemis program uh, participant. Uh, the UK, of course, is, is as well. But I don't traditionally think of the UK as having a deep history in, in lunar exploration in the way that maybe uh, Japan does. So from the perspective of the UK Space Agency, uh, what is the opportunity for the UK in participating in space exploration activities? So in the UK, you're right, you're right that we don't have that um, history, but I'll come on to that in a moment. Exploring space through robotic and human missions is really important to us because it has the power to create that new knowledge um, and develop technologies, grow economies and inspire humanity, which is one of the most important things of all. And that's true to all nations, especially the UK, where we remain a major contributor to the European Space Agency, in addition to our national funding activities. And our membership of the European Space Agency is really important to us. Um, it combines the resources of 22 partners, and so we can achieve missions that no one country could achieve um, on its own. And that membership has also enabled us to collaborate with other partners. So it's opened up a kind of gateway, if you like, to involvement in major international missions. And that's with Japan, with Canada, Australia, the US and others. But our expertise is also helping with um, relationships outside of those usual partnerships. So we have... Um, UK-led uh, activities, missions with Taiwan, Philippines, Thailand, Singapore, and Vietnam at the moment. So we have um, our expertise in the UK, even though we're not leading those uh, missions ourselves um, with, with various partners. But it's true, our lunar legacy isn't as extensive as other nations. Um, I don't think that's a barrier to our efforts, and I think that we can contribute lots of things um, to future lunar missions. So, for example, the UK is a major contributor to the Rosalind Franklin mission, which, of course, is about the search for life on Mars, evidence of life on Mars. But the rover is the first of its kind to be built in the UK, and it provides um, excellent, adaptable capabilities that can be utilised for future um, lunar surface missions. So we're also leading the development of radioisotope power systems, part of ESA's Endure system program. And all lunar missions will need those reliable, long-duration power systems to survive the lunar night um, and explore permanently shaded areas too. So there's strong global interest in those, and the UK um, can, can provide that technology, both institutional and commercial users. So, uh, to, to conclude, um, we are also supporting the studies for small nuclear reactors in space, um, which could have that transformative effect on space exploration and what humanity could achieve on the lunar surface. Uh, to that end, we've invested quite heavily in moonlight, um, which will provide comms and navigation for lunar surface missions. 
So as the, the lunar ecosystem develops, there's quite a wide range of services, capabilities, technologies that we'll need. That's right. I think both in Japan and in, in the UK, we see different niches and different opportunities to, to contribute to that, including bringing in different yes. industry sectors and, and finding the, the kind of unique value adds that, that, that the ecosystem can, or the industry in, in, in your respective countries can provide. So thank you for that. So, so Young, I want to turn now to, um, <laughs> to Korea, which is uh, having quite a, an active um, time right now. Right? We, we know that the new Korean space agency, CASA, was established and opened operations in May. Uh, Korea continues to operate KPLO. Uh, in a uh, Korea Pathfinder lunar orbiter, did I get that right, uh, in, in lunar orbit. Um, so f from your perspective, can you tell us why Korea is pursuing a lunar exploration program and the roles of CASA and CARI in that exploration program? Right, thank you. So before um, I get to the question, I just want to say uh, thank you for inviting me on the panel. And originally, uh, the space agency, I was planning to participate, uh, but unfortunately, they could not make it, so I'm here uh, on their behalf. And um, as uh, you, Ian, mentioned, uh, Korea Aerospace Administration, CASA, uh, was recently ad established um, in June of this year. And Kari and Kasi is now placed under this new space agency. Uh, just to give you some more background on what's going on uh, with Korea's uh, space exploration, uh, you already mentioned KPRO, but our uh, first space exploration mission, <coughs> uh, KPRO, was developed uh, by Kari under the Ministry of ICT uh, with participation of Domestic Industry and Research Institute. It was launched in August 2022 and was safely uh, inserted to uh, lunar orbit at the end of that year and has been successfully operating for the past year and a half. Uh, since then, and KPRO also began releasing scientific data earlier this year. Mm -hmm. And the mission period was also extended from one year to three Hello. years. And in addition to this, uh, next year, our new space agency plans to officially initiate a follow-up lunar lander project uh, with a target launch uh, date in 2032. And also, we have a lunar science payload uh, developed by CASI, our Space Science Institute, uh, which will be launched uh, on board NASA's CLPS mission next year as well. So, um, as you mentioned, we have a lot of things going on in terms of lunar exploration in Korea. This is a very exciting time uh, for us. Um, now, you, you asked about the role of CASA and CARI in the lunar exploration. And obviously, the new space agency will play the leading role uh, as the control tower. Uh, and they will have uh, a budget and management responsibility, including uh, things such as securing budget, planning, managing, and evaluating the projects. And they will also serve as the contact point for all international uh, affairs, international cooperation activities. And CARI and CASI will still play a role uh, and participate in lunar uh, exploration projects uh, for instance, by developing key technologies and uh, by uh, taking part in uh, scientific research based on our existing expertise uh, in, in engineering and, and, and science, respectively. And of course, industry will also play an active role uh, in this uh, based on the government and the space agency's policy to promote uh, new space and industry participation as well. We also have, I think uh, one of the Korean colleagues uh, in the previous uh, session mentioned about uh, a public-private uh, partnership in Korea, but this is also a very important topic for us as well. And um, you also asked um, um, why Korea is investing or, or we are uh, pursuing lunar exploration, what's the motivation? And as you can see from the establishment of the new space agency, Korean government has a strong commitment uh, to space, and we aim to become uh, one of the, 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 the five uh, major space players. Uh, I guess uh, that depends on how you count uh, <laughs> the numbers. But um, lunar exploration can also be understood in this context. So we started out with satellite program. Um, we have a launcher program 
now we're challenging ourselves with the uh, exploration program. And although the barriers to entry to space exploration has been lower compared to uh, what it used to be in the past, space exploration still requires uh, high technology, skilled manpower, and large budgets. And this is a field uh, that kind of reveals the country's collective capabilities. And it has political and diplomatic implications, uh, uh, as well as uh, national branding and national pride. Uh, so I think this is the main reason why South Korea and many other countries are pursuing lunar exploration. I know this is the legacy of Apollo era, and now we're entering into the new you know, era of uh, lunar exploration. I'm sitting next to iSpace. Um, but, I, but I think this still counts as an important value of lunar exploration. And of course, our government also uh, recognizes that there are new values brought uh, through uh, by uh, this um, uh, commercial activities. So another reason uh, for Korea's lunar exploration is obviously to stay ahead of the upcoming lunar economy. And so the government's lunar program uh, will serve as a catalyst for building a domestic uh, industry base in the long run. And it will also help Korea to become an important part of global uh, industrial ecosystem uh, around lunar exploration. So. That was a long answer, but, but that's it. Thank you. No, thank you, Sayang. So I think in all three of the remarks from our government or our government research institute present, presenters here, we heard a motivation about developing the role of industry in, in, this, in this space exploration ecosystem and, and the lunar ecosystem. Uh, Sayang, I think if we went back to Apollo, that probably would not have been one of the motivations, right? So the national pride motivation would have been there, the technology development motivation would have been there, but this industry element, I, I think, would not have been as, as prevalent, right? So there's a key difference uh, there today. So let's now turn to our industry uh, representatives. We, we have two uh, uh, parts of the industry, space exploration ecosystem here, a lunar exploration company and a human, commercial human space flight uh, company. So uh, Hakamada-san, Wakada-san, I'm gonna ask, both of you have basically the, the same question. So maybe Hakamada-san, if you want to start, and then Wakada-san to, uh, to, to follow. So commercial activities, including those of iSpace and those of Axiom, are creating new partnership models and benefits. Uh, from the perspective of your company's activities in either lunar development or human spaceflight, how do these commercial capabilities increase partnership opportunities in space exploration, and what benefits can companies and countries see from those activities. So Hakamada-san and then Wakada-san. Yep, me first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me on this panel. Uh, well, I started iSpace 2010, so 14 years ago. And at the moment, well, unfortunately, I, I could not see such a well, huge movement or the interest to the moon. Uh, but now I see many of the interest to the, to the moon and then the uh, I, I see a lot of change since then. Uh, well, iSpace uh, since then, uh, well, growing uh, in the lunar market uh, industry, and uh, we born from the Japan. However, we have office in U United mm -hmm. States and then Luxembourg in Europe, and then uh, we have very international presence. Mm -hmm. And then not only just the organization, but also uh, we have a variety of the uh, customers and investors too. Uh, in case of the uh, for the customer side, uh, as a first mission, uh, we conduct the first mission as a commercial mission. But uh, we had uh, UAE space space agency MB MBRC as a customer to deliver their lunar rovers uh, to the lunar surface, and then also we had contract with JAXA as well, uh, small robotics, and then also we had mixed with uh, the commercial. Uh, well, payload as a customer as well. And the second mission, uh, we were, well, by the way, first mission was uh, already more than one year ago to attempt to, to, to land. Uh, well, time passed flying, <laughs> but uh, well, second mission, uh, the, this is one of the uh, strengths of, as a commercial mission, but uh, we are going to launch second mission this year already. And then we have 
The second mission is purely commercial mission. This time, including customer. Uh, customer is from the uh, Japanese private uh, company uh, called Takasago uh, Sama Engineering. They want to uh, bring the uh, technology demonstration uh, device to spit uh, water into hydrogen oxygen on the uh, lunar surface. And then uh, we are planning a third mission from US uh, 2026. And then now we also start working on to develop new lander <laughs> from Japan with support from the Japanese government as well. And then, uh, as I said, also we have uh, a European presence. And then we're going to uh, deliver, develop uh, our first uh, European lunar rover uh, in Luxembourg. And then, as a part of the ice space capability, uh, we're going to bring that rover to the lunar surface as a second mission. So uh, we have a variety of the uh, partnership or the uh, business uh, with a variety of the uh, entities. And then the, the one of these, how can you say, uh, the, the strengths, uh, uniqueness we can bring from the commercial or the industry is, I think, sustainability. Uh, Due, thanks to the diversity of the customers and the investors, not only just the uh, uh, government funding, but also uh, we have uh, commercial customers. And also now we are accessing the uh, uh, capital market to uh, where after IPO. And then we have a variety of the access to the funding or the financial uh, point of view. So uh, we can uh, provide the sustainable missions uh, to the uh, any type of the uh, customers uh, pre-use. And then um, uh, in case of the government mission, the government need to rely on the only single source of the government budget. Mm -hmm. However, we can approach to the different type of the uh, government and then uh, customers, uh, and then including uh, capital market. Uh, so that, I think that kind of the sustainability of the uh, the mission uh, would benefit to the uh, all the customers, and also we share the cost uh, variety of the customers at the same time. We don't rely on single customer for the single mission, so uh, the customer side also can share the uh, their cost. Uh, that is also the benefit to lower the uh, entry uh, barriers for the uh, smaller countries or the uh, small companies too. Thank you. So, uh, Okada san. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ian. And thank you uh, to the uh, Secure World Foundation and the Cabinet Office for this opportunity to talk in this panel. And uh, I uh, was with the JAXA Japanese Space Agency over three decades, and I'm in the private sector. So now I can see the difference between the governmental human space exploration and uh, the commercial side of it. And I uh, believe that uh, for the uh, sustainable growth of human space exploration, uh, uh, the commercial sectors leading the uh, LEO activity is a crucial uh, part so that we can continue uh, the you know, human exploration beyond the low Earth orbit. Um, I had the privilege to fly in space for over 500 days, but the uh, uh, International Space Station program, uh, Japan, US, and Europeans, and Canadians, um, uh, the Roscosmos are part of that. But the ISS has brought a lot of opportunities for the international astronauts to fly in space. But uh, it was within the, the partner countries only. And uh, I had a privilege to uh, work with uh, British and then uh, uh, Korean astronauts. I never flew with them, but I had a chance to train with them in, in Houston as, it, as well as in Moscow. But uh, the flight opportunities were limited to those ISS partner countries usually. But uh, with the, uh, the commercial uh, human space flight programs, we are opening up the opportunity for flight and also utilization of the uh, space asset to those countries that is beyond the uh, traditional ISS uh, partnership. So um, uh, Axiom Space has already completed three uh, successful uh, private astronaut missions uh, starting in 2022, 23, and 24. Uh, <clears throat> we have flown uh, uh, like individual uh, private astronauts. Uh, some of them are like a government astronauts from Europe, from uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, and, and many, some of those countries have never had their sovereign astronauts to fly in space. And uh, we have also conducted a variety of experiments with more than 50 uh, research partners of uh, 105 uh, research subjects. And then uh, those crew members of the private astronauts missions have conducted more than 75 
educational or outreach programs and uh, uh, talk to the you know people, uh, students all over the world. So in essence, with the uh, emergence of uh, uh, private sector uh, commercial human space flight, we are expanding the access to space beyond the internationally corporate program like uh, ISS. So uh, I think that's a great uh, role of uh, commercial space flight. And uh, also as far as benefits, um, by working together uh, between the uh, companies and also government uh, and commercial entity collaboration, we are uh, sharing the knowledge and also sharing the risk and also uh, the assets that we need to conduct the space flight. So there are a lot of benefits that we can gain. And uh, also this partnership between the, the commercial sectors and commercial sectors and the government, that we can amplify the uh, innovation, the pace of innovation, and also we will be able to broaden the scope of exploration that is not limited to the Earth orbit, but also uh, to the Moon and, uh, and Mars. So uh, we have a variety of uh, benefits by working together between the commercial industry, uh, entities and the commercial entities and the government. Thank you for that. So I think in both uh, Hakamada-san and, and Wakaza-san, you, your remarks talk about, uh, I think, a diversity of services, a diversity of capabilities that, are at, that, that, that the commercial sector can add to the existing ecosystem, and then that helps kind of diversify the, the types of benefits and the types of participation that we can see. Okay, so I, I think we're beginning to pick up on a couple of themes already, and that is this diversification. It's the role of industry to help build a more resilient and sustainable supply chain, but it's then that governments still are looking to provide the benefit of space exploration in terms of driving innovation and in terms of increasing participation in space activities from um, the, the broader um, population segment. So. Uh, as we go here, we've got about half of the panel left. I want to come back to some of those themes. Um, beginning to see some audience questions come in. It's also been helpfully reminded by the audience that we're at a sustainability summit. So I have a couple of sustain lunar, su lunar and space exploration sustainability questions um, that I want to ask as well. So uh, we're going to try to keep things moving over the next 30 minutes and we'll, we'll select questions around. So uh, I want to come back to <laughs> Yamanaka-san. Um, so, now, having heard the remarks from all four of the other panelists, plus yourself, uh, what do you think the main opportunities and changes are in the space community that is driving this interest in, in space exploration? Okay, um, thank you for asking. That is a very important question. Um, okay, well, now we know that um, many country, many agency, many private company, and wonderful astronaut <laughs> want to go to moon and the lunar space. So, so, which means that many people want to go there. What does it mean? Okay, for example, <coughs> then everyone need the electricity. If you go there, everybody need electricity. Everybody need the communication system. Everybody need the, you know, position, navigation, timing, information. Everybody need it. So why, why not to share <laughs> this information? It is an interoperability, commonality type of discussion, which is very important as agency uh, for the you know, future activity as uh, um, you know, the be benefit parts. Um, we can think this situation as competition, but I think it is a very good opportunity for everybody. For example, if you, if we, you have a very good communication component, which might be used by everybody. If you have a very good battery, if you have a very good solar panel, it, it, it might be able to use by everybody, and PNT system as well. So I think there, there is a lots of good opportunity now exists for everybody, not not just agency. So as an agency, we we would like to um, keep working in the commonality and the interoperability discussion, like navigation, communication. These things, you know, should be done by the you know worldwide, <laughs> not not just by one country, by everybody. So we want to, as an agency, we want to pave a way for the future activities, like Hakamada-san and the wonderful Wakata-san and other agencies, as a country can can be very active on the surface on the Cisruna uh, the region. Yeah, yeah, this is my opinion. Yeah, so, so thank you for that, because it actually leads in very well to a question 
that, that one of our audience members has asked. So you're talking there about some very basic infrastructure needs that we need to enable sustained lunar presence and sustained exploration activities, communications, navigation, uh, electricity, things that we just take for granted here on, on Earth, and to a certain extent, even in low Earth orbit, those things exist, right? Um, and then you talked about collaboration, right, to, to get there. So uh, we have a question from the audience about how government and industry can collaborate to kind of drive these forward. So I'm actually going to take this and, and ask this to Hakamada-san and, and Wakada-san, so both from an industry perspective, but also Wakada-san from your, your past government background. Um, so how, what, what concrete next steps can we take to ensure government and industry collaboration, in particular here in the APAC region, uh, to make that lunar exploration that, that, that Koji is talking about, to make it sustainable in terms of programmatics and in terms of execution? Um, to either of you. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, well, uh, the government-private safety uh, partnership uh, in, in the CIS Luna especially uh, would be m m normally a government uh, create uh, well infrastructure first, and then a commercial company uh, will work on the application on top of the uh, uh, infrastructure. However, in the Luna case, uh, because we have been already working on the transportation so on, so it's going to be more collaborative work on even the uh, infrastructure side. And then from the uh, commercial point of view, infrastructure is uh, attractive because it's sustainable. <laughs> the, because there's uh, many customers, essentially there's a need for use. So, uh, as a, a private company, uh, we are interested to involve uh, the, the development of the uh, infrastructure and the utilize the infrastructure too. Uh, however, we can do everything by only one company or, or only one player. So, the, as Yamanaka-san said, interoperability will be very in important uh, well, concept. Uh, we can involve as a commercial company part of the infrastructure. However, uh, we can we should work together to integrate uh, every asset uh, we can utilize on the moon uh, to to solve for the not only uh, us but also the everyone. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> I agree with uh, what Hakamasan said. Uh, I think this uh, government uh, and private sector partnership is uh, crucial. Um, I uh, started in this human space flight business uh, over three decades ago, but uh, I see a lot of uh, startup companies, uh, you know, going into this challenging field of exploration. And uh, it, it's amazing that uh, so many companies are doing that. But uh, I think this uh, anchor tenancy or the governmental support with the partnership is very crucial for those startup companies to be able to continue their challenge, uh, you know, in a sustainable manner. So uh, it only, uh, it's not only for the hum uh, lunar missions only, but uh, low Earth orbit operation as well. Um, now we have uh, uh, established the uh, cargo supply system. Um, uh, Koji-san worked on the HTV, uh, Japanese cargo supply missions to the space station. And on the United States, uh, SpaceX and uh, Northrop Grumman, they have uh, uh, established the uh, uh, cargo supply system. But this was possible because of this anchor tenancy of the government uh, international space station program because uh, we had a destination which is called ISS. Uh, those companies were able to build their spacecraft to, to deliver the cargo as well as uh, crew member. And then as a result, they are now flourishing with their operation uh, that will go beyond the low Earth orbit. So um, in essence, it's very important to have this uh, partnership between the government and the private sector in order to uh, let uh, the startup companies grow and then uh, reach to a fluoration of the operation. So, uh, um, and also um, this uh, private astronaut mission I mentioned, uh, the access to space is a key. And uh, there are so many countries uh, who have never sent uh, their sovereign astronauts to the space station. So with the uh, emergency of the private sectors, we are able to uh, send uh, uh, not only those uh, government astronauts, but those individuals and institutions who have uh, uh, the value of sending humans and also, um, non-traditional industries are now utilizing the uh, microgravity environment, uh, and which is very, uh, very important so that we can utilize the microgravity because we have so many unknown uh, facts and factors of uh, utilization of microgravity. Uh, of course, Japan and the United States, European countries, uh, many countries have already utilized the microgravity for a lot of 
uh, <laughs> research to develop new materials and for life science, but uh, there are still a lot of fields that is still unknown. And uh, by having this uh, traditionally non-traditional uh, industry participating in the experiment, uh, we will be able to utilize the microgravity environment for future in-space manufacturing and other things. So. Uh, so access to space and also non-traditional industry partners participation is the key. Yeah, the, 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 the second part of that is particular, and particularly interesting to me, right, is if we're trying to grow the space economy, the space sector, and the ways that it benefits on society larger, right, getting connections into some of these bigger, more established industry sectors outside of our fun but small space sector I think is going to be a, a very key importance so glad to hear you talk about that. Um, I want to take a slightly different theme now and I'm going to turn to Julie and, and to So Young. We have a number of questions here um, recognizing that we're at the space uh, summit for space sustainability and saying lunar and space exploration is taking us into new environments where we have maybe new sustainability questions or need to develop specific sustainability practices to enable um, to enable space exploration. Uh, so, Julie, I'm going to start with you. Um, your portfolio at, at, at UKSA includes both the space science and space exploration team, as well as the team focused on space sustainability. A very interesting combination. Um, so, questions about lunar sustainability. I think you're the ideal person on this panel. Uh, so, what steps are necessary to build sustainability, both programmatically and in its environmental sense, into exploration initiatives, including lunar activities? Yes, you're right. It is an interesting combination in my um, portfolio. And I remember when I joined the space agency and we just had a bit of a reorganization. So both of those things became part of my directorate. And there was a question, you know, why those two together? But actually, you know, we can see, we've seen... Um, with some of the exploration launches that haven't been successful recently, have crossed right over into my sustainability <laughs> portfolio as we've tracked um, those uh, objects as they re-enter. And so um, it's not necessarily what we would be wanting, but actually um, we have to see those two things in balance, I think. And we know that the moon is a really unique site as it's, it's visible to all of us and therefore it's shared by all of humankind. And we have to be realistic that we are entering this new phase of lunar exploration and it is going to become the next, um, uh, the next sort of industrial environment potentially. And so we have to think about those principles of sustainability and responsibility on how we explore the moon, but to do that in a very coordinated way internationally. Um, I've had lots of conversations this week on that subject and how do we really get the um, community to start making progress uh, in those areas. We have lots of conversations about that, but how do you turn that into practicality? The Artemis Accords, are a really good step um, in that direction, but there is a lot more detailed work to be done um, in how those principles flow down into mission design and how those principles flow into uh, our future activities. There's existing frameworks, the COSBAR Planet on, uh, Panel on Planetary Protection, and that's critical to our shared global ambitions. Um, and we are responsible pioneers in space. And I'm, I just recall a conversation last, I'm name dropping now very heavily, but uh, I was at Buckingham Palace last year with the launch of the um, Astra Carta, which was heavily written by uh, King Charles himself. And there was an absolutely wonderful phrase in there, which is, as far as we are aware, we are the sole custodians of the universe. And that's something that we really have to um, bear in mind. We want to make sure that we um, have regulation on planetary protection and limit that possibility of contamination. That's on Earth and that's also on other celestial bodies. So we're reminded full of our past exploration and endeavors and some of the damage that has been done with that as we go forward into the future and think about the legacy that we will be leaving behind in that regard. There are really practical things that we need to have in place as well. So we, we've touched on it a little bit. Our in-orbit servicing and manufacturing um, and in-situ resource utilisation uh, technologies, 
those are key capabilities that the UK and other countries are developing. But those technologies will be absolutely critical in helping us have a more sustainable um, presence on the lunar surface and beyond. So we really need to get that win-win situation where we have commercialization of exploration and it is sustainable and it's something that is commercially viable, but also that we drive those um, developments of those technologies as well. Thank you, Julie. Um, so, Young, I want to um, turn to you. So, Korea is obviously operating KPLO um, in, in, in lunar orbit right now. We might say, you know, there's not very many spacecraft in lunar orbit, right? You know, there's not much going on there. We can, we can operate. Um, but have you encountered any operational issues of, of the type that Julie just, just mentioned? Right, so uh, thank you for asking this question. Um, and some of you uh, may know this already, but just a few weeks ago, um, there was a conference on lunar, uh, ac sustainable lunar activities or organized uh, by you and USA, you and Office for Outer Space Affairs uh, just before the COPOS plenary session this year. And, uh, and, and our space agency uh, also uh, participated in a panel in this event, and they actually shared uh, the experience of operating KP80 in this context. And right now there are um, six lunar orbiters uh, or, or, uh, orbiting around the moon, and three of them, uh, including KP80, are in the low uh, lunar orbit. So these are KP80 and NASA's LRO and um, India's Chandrayaan 2. And they all orbit in, uh, around the similar altitudes, as I said, and they routinely share orbital information and collision uh, risk analysis using a platform called a MEDCAP, which is actually uh, provided by uh, NASA's JPL. And they consult each other when there's a, a, a chance of collision between these um, orbiters. And I was quite surprised uh, to find out uh, when I was told by our engineers that that these, um, the so-called red alarms uh, are often, uh, they, they have these red alarms uh, quite often, and um, ever since KPRO has been operating, so within the past year and a half, there has been 40 red, red alarms involving these um, uh, orbiters. And uh, some of these are actually uh, naturally resolved uh, over time because you get more accurate uh, orbital data. And some you can resolve the issue by uh, m uh, doing a routine orbit ma uh, maintenance maneuvers. But some of them you need to have a specific maneuvering just to avoid this uh, potential collision. And KP at all till now has performed three collision avoidance maneuvers specifically dedicated to, to, to avoid this risk. And one was to avoid a collision with um, ISRO Chandrayaan-2. Another one was with NASA's LRO. And actually, the third one was with JAXA's SLIM uh, when they were about to land. And we actually had to make a very quick decision within a day to make this maneuver uh, to, uh, to make sure that JAXA SLIM can land uh, safely. And I think I also heard from an um, iSpace colleague during the UN conference that iSpace also had a a potential collision uh, issue uh, when you had your mission. So this is something real. Um, we did not, uh, uh, that we haven't discussed much. Uh, and right now there's no uh, mutually agreed upon international uh, consultation mechanism or protocol to, to resolve uh, such collision risks. And uh, luckily KPRO, LRO, and Chandra Yayun, Yan Tu has this um, a, a daily uh, uh, exchange of information. Um, so, in the in, in, in the absence of international uh, practice, we were still able to manage uh, exchange of information and communication during normal times. So, we when, when there were uh, collision risks, uh, we were able to uh, consult with each other. And if needed, we were able to proactively uh, make uh, maneuvers. However, this is only a voluntary activity between only a few actors. And not all actors are involved in this process. And 
and also uh, this kind of maneuvers require fuel consumption and also temporary uh, suspension of some of the payloads. Uh, so it's, it, it may impact your mission and there are also some costs associated uh, with, uh, with such maneuvers. So uh, in case of Korea, in, uh, with our experience of operation of KP-80, we realized that there's need for information sharing platform and mutually agreed upon uh, international protocols to identify and manage the risk of collision between the missions around the moon, just like, uh, just like we, we do on uh, the Earth, uh, uh, satellites orbiting around the Earth. And uh, in particular, because the moon does not have a, a, an atmosphere, uh, space objects cannot just fall and burn up in the atmosphere like they do on the Earth. And also, uh, we are going to have manned missions to the moon uh, on the surface and around the moon. So we don't want to have any catastrophic uh, events happening. So um, this is very important. And I think uh, people who are sitting in this room today uh, knows the importance of this topic very much because uh, you're all experts on the issues such as SSA, STM, and space debris, and so on. So uh, in order for uh, the humankind to avoid uh, repeating the same mistakes uh, that we have done on Earth, on the moon, I think it's very important that we, uh, we learn the lessons from the discussions uh, on similar issues uh, on, on Earth. And um, fortunately, um, uh, this topic is, in, is actually included in the Artemis Accords. Uh, there's a section about um, uh, orbital debris, and UN COPOS also decided during the plenary this year uh, that uh, a, a thing called Action Team on Lunar Activities Consultation, ATLAC, uh, will be established. So, um, and this is going to be one of the topics uh, to be uh, dealt with within that uh, new action team. And uh, Korea plans to actively participate in the discussions. And I really uh, hope that uh, uh, the people in this community will also contribute to, uh, to the discussions uh, coming up in the future. Thank you, Sayang. So that's was quite eye-opening, I would say, for me to hear that only with three spacecraft and in that short of a time there have been that many alerts and then that many of those alerts have actually required active uh, conjunction avoidance maneuvers. And that is a, a clear uh, message to me that as operations increase, we really do need to figure out these, these coordination mechanisms because it does not sound like the um, voluntary system that JPL is providing is, is, is scalable to the future. Uh, so we have about 11 minutes left. I have a wonderful amount of questions from the audience that we are never going to get to in, in 11 minutes. So it's a sign that we've had a good discussion, but unfortunately won't be able to, uh, to get those. So I'm gonna to try to get through two more questions before we wrap up. Um, this next one is an audience question and it relates to this coordination theme that we were just discussing, but a little bit broader. I'm gonna start with this question for Akamada-san, but open it up to, to others who wish to, to, to speak to it as well. How do we balance or how do we consider the different needs of science, the different needs of industry in lunar development? So how can these different areas both work together but balance potentially competing, competing interests? Well, uh, yeah, very yeah, good question. Uh, well, uh, we are working with the government and the private sector as well. And the government uh, needs is uh, mainly science. And then, uh, well, commercial, needs is uh, part of the technology demonstration and then also the marketing or the promotion type of the needs exist. And then um, at this moment, uh, we don't see any challenges uh, combining these two. Uh, well, some of the, the, the my challenge, my, if I say, is the, the marketing rights, how to uh, share the marketing rights. Uh, we, we are using marketing rights as a business as well, like uh, we, we did this. And uh, so that, that is one, one of the challenges. Everyone wants to promote yeah. because lunar landing, lunar mission is still very attractive for the everyone to catch attention. Uh, that, however, uh, at, once we land on the moon, 
I think the, the major purpose is collect data at this moment, e either the uh, science purpose or the technology demonstration purpose. And uh, in that sense, uh, we see the same engineering uh, capability or the uh, needs. So we don't see any uh, difference uh, on that point. But in the future, uh, if the uh, once the, the activity uh, become more diversified, uh, many different uh, well uh, needs uh, will be uh, comes from the even the commercial side, uh, government side as well. So we, we need to prepare for in the future. However, at this moment, uh, the major objective to collect data for the capture the image and uh, so on. So yeah, that, that is current. Thank you. Yeah. Okatsu san, Koji san, anybody else wish to, to try that question? Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just a little bit. Um, okay. Well, there's many discussion science exploration, science exploration, but that we think we, we need both together. Um, for example, science needs the exploration apparently. For example, if we have a pre precious rover, there is a variety of things that the scientists uh, can do using such capabilities, so which means that exploration enables science. And from science, we can get a lot of data, a lot of information, a lot of knowledge for the future. So both we, we work both together, and this is what we are uh, thinking of, of, of all the time. Just, just add <laughs> the comment, yes. Well, one thing that I can add is, uh, for example, I think by having this uh, commercial entities uh, involved in this uh, development of, for, for example, Luna spacesuit, uh, the owner of the new spacesuit that, that the Americans will be using when uh, Artemis three crew lands on, on the surface of the moon, as well as in the future, Japanese astronauts will be wearing Axiom spacesuit to land on the surface of the moon. But the spacesuit itself is owned by Axiom. So NASA is uh, going to be using that service. And not only NASA, but the other uh, private industry can also use that. By having this flexibility of uh, service uh, provided by a commercial company, Government can utilize that asset to accomplish their science, and also the uh, commercial entities or whoever wants to pay for that will be able to utilize that. So by having this uh, commercial partner involved in this uh, uh, development of a new spacesuit and an operation, it gives, I think, more access to different types of utilization. And I could add to that because the UK Space Agency is um, working with Axiom Space for um, a fully UK astronaut mission. Um, and that is a really important proof of concept that we are um, attempting for a commercially funded mission. So it will be commercially funded through sponsorship and it will enable us to fly our own astronauts, but also to benefit our space sector in um, access to microgravity. So um, it's so important that we, although the UK attracts more private space investment than any other country um, in Europe, and that's our model in the UK Space Agency to catalyze that investment. But we want to make the most of those opportunities um, to work with commercial partners to enable us to have better access for everybody. Okay, thank you. So uh, watching that clock, <laughs> counting down big red letters, uh, I wanna get to a, a point here at the end that I think is kind of running through all of our comments in, in one way or another, and it's also been in some of the, the audience questions. So uh, new types of space exploration partnership. That was the, the theme, the title of the, the panel, and then benefit is part of partnership, right? And communication is part of how we identify and explain why we're pursuing these opportunities and what the reasons and, and, and the, the, the outcomes of them are. So I think most of us in this room would probably recognize that space, activi space activities contribute a good deal to societal good and to societal benefit. But that link is maybe less clear or less direct for space exploration activities instead of something like communications or remote sensing, right, where there's a real direct immediate application. Um, and in some cases, members of the public might question the benefits of expending public money, taxpayer money, even private money on space exploration. Uh, so how can we in the space exploration community, we in the space community, better communicate or better improve our communication of the benefits of space exploration activities? So how can we communicate better about the themes that we're talking in this panel? I'd love for each of you to answer that very simple question in one minute. Yeah. Yeah. So starting with, yeah. One minute? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, 
Okay, but, but sometimes it's, it's the frequently asked question, and then, uh, for example, NASA say that there are three purpose, three reasons why we do the exploration. One is the science, second one is the national posture, third one is uh, inspiration. And uh, national posture is uh, maybe the one of today's discussion theme, uh, that how we can collaborate, cooperate, working together for, for the future, you know, how to strengthen our, our capability, not just by one country, but by, by many countries and with industry people and astronauts, how we can strengthen that. But the third one, inspiration, I think most important thing. Inspiration is like, uh, you know, in, in, for example, kids see the wonderful astronaut or landing on the ice base. Oh, it's cool. <laughs> we want to do it <laughs> in the future. If I grown up, then, then I, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be an engineer to make this, this kind of thing. So I think inspiration is very important to, to, to perform the exploration. Although, of course, resources are limited. So within the limited resources, we, we would like to do <coughs> our best for the future generation. Oh, we want to do it. <laughs> we want to make it. Yeah, that, this is our the thinking. Thank you. OK, so uh, our company is focused on the LEO uh, utilization. So from the LEO standpoint, uh, the message that we have to convey to the public is that uh, we have a global economic potential exists in the LEO. And uh, that will benefit the entire world. And also another message that we have to convey is that uh, we talked about the access to space needs to be expanded. That's what the commercial entities are doing. But uh, expanding access to space builds not only the, uh, the utilization opportunities, but, uh, but also the awareness or education of what is really possible in microgravity or what, what, what's possible in space. This is the message that we have to convey to the public. Excellent. Well, from, from our context, uh, well, I, don't, I try to avoid using exploration to the Luna. Uh, things uh, I, I say, Cisluna ecosystem, mm -hmm. and uh, e ecosystem is important to circulate the the, the the things, especially money. Without circulation of the money, growth of the uh, industry uh, for the public uh, people they don't care about. So the connection to the space and the Earth economy is important. So I like to uh, develop such a connection. Uh, and then also the the Cisluna is important to to be uh, to support the backbone of the DO activities as well. So I, I think it's also the part of the ecosystem uh, philosophy. Interesting. All right, I think all the speakers have already uh, uh, given uh, uh, good answers. So I just want to point to a specific document uh, which is relevant to. Uh, this topic, which is ISECG's uh, Benefit of Space Exploration White Paper, uh, which will be published very soon. So it does contain all the benefits, uh, societal benefits of space exploration in this, in this uh, document. And also um, um, UK, Kari, uh, JAXA, all of us are member of this um, um, ISECG, which is International Space Exploration Coordination Group. Uh, so that would be my short answer. Just want to add, uh, when we communicate, I think uh, we use we should use a, a, a new uh, communication channels, including uh, social media, etc. Um, uh, I don't know if you know uh, BTS, but uh, BTS songs uh, were included on NASA's astronaut uh, list of songs to be played on the Artemis missions. And our, um, our uh, young people, our, our public, got really excited about this. And uh, so inspiration still counts as societal benefit. And then using a, a new uh, communication platform, especially targeting the, uh, the next generation, I think is really important. So I'm going to hand over the answer to my question, and I'm going to do that by encouraging every single one of you to go seek out one of our young professionals, and that's David, who's come across from Uganda, who I had the privilege of meeting um, just before I came onto this panel. And he spoke absolutely beautifully and with huge enthusiasm about his work in how you communicate with indigenous communities communities in countries that might not typically have um, that heritage of um, space exploration, but also that have huge economic and societal um, challenges. Um, and, and how do you make that case for space and how do you communicate that? And that is both in how we articulate that to those communities, 
but it is also about how we engage with indigenous communities to ask them about their opinion about space. The moon is a sacred space for many people on the earth and we absolutely have to pay that due regard. So go and speak to David, um, who is sitting over there, um, and um, seek him out and have a conversation and, and there, there you will have your answer from me. Well, thank you, Julie, for that inspiring and I think actually somewhat challenging way to, to end, right? But that, that sounds like a very good conversation to take into the, the network ring break and the rest of the, the, rest of the conversation. So uh, I want to thank uh, the five uh, panelists to thank the audience. Apologies for not getting to all of the questions, but thank you all. Um, yeah.